Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of Words Unplugged. I'm Michael Bunyard, and we're here chatting with Mafan Karim, who recently wrote an excellent ebook entitled Let's Fix Healthcare Before Patients Run Out of Patients. And the subtitle of the book is actually A SIAM Strategy or a Customer Identity and Access Management Strategy to Improve Digital Experiences in Healthcare. So I don't think Mafan's trying to fix all of healthcare, but rather just the uh, the digital experiences portion of that. So welcome, Mafan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure to be here. So, you know, you've been head of our healthcare practice for some time now, Mafan. What was your inspiration to write this e-guide at this point in time? Thanks, Michael. Um, so two reasons, really. Uh, one is... In my role as uh, head of healthcare and head of solutions at WSO2, uh, I, I see a lot of the product aspects of, of how rolling out solutions, rolling out vertical solutions. Uh, as part of that, I also head the solutions architecture team, which means my team works with a large number of enterprise customers, and we see their challenges, their constraints, their success stories uh, in a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, all of us are consumers of the healthcare system. Right? We are patients, we are either temporary patients, uh, long-term patients, et cetera. And we all see some of the good service items of healthcare as well as some of the challenges of healthcare globally all around the world. And I am a consumer of healthcare as well. So this paper comes from two lenses. One is from our overall experience working with enterprises. And then secondly, as an individual consumer of the system. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think as a uh, patient myself, um, you know, I've definitely had to have patients with it when it comes to dealing with some of some of the healthcare providers. But I think like uh, maybe some aspects have been better than others, like maybe payer, my payer experience has been really good, but the provider experience has been, you know, really bad. So kind of a two-part question, like, first of all, overall, why do you think healthcare has been slower to innovate than other industries that you deal with on a daily basis? And then second part is just, is there parts of the healthcare kind of chain that are doing better than others? That's a good question. So let's, let's start there. Uh, before that, maybe let's take a step back and, and globalize some of this terminology, right? because okay. healthcare is very region specific and there are some terminologies and some organizational structures that are unique to certain regions. Uh, if you take the US, you have the hospitals, which are broadly categorized under providers, provider networks. Uh, and you have individual hospitals, you have groups of hospitals, and this is a, a global standard as well, right? And we, we can refer to them as hospitals or providers. Uh, in, in, in the US and some parts of the world, healthcare insurance is, is big and it's part of the ecosystem. Healthcare insurance helps pay for uh, providers or hospitals. Uh, in the US, it's called payers. In some parts of the world, it's called health insurance. <clears throat> some parts of the world, it's called healthcare insurance, so on and so forth. So broadly, we'll refer to that as healthcare insurance or payers. Uh, in some parts of the world, both these concepts are plugged together. They're integrated. Uh, so that those are called integrated delivery networks, IDNs, where a payer and a provider or health insurance and hospitals are combined together and there's a larger network. And then, of course, there are other aspects. There are life sciences organizations, there are software organizations, there are medical device manufacturers, there are pharmacy organizations. In the U.S., there is, again, another unique player called a pharmacy benefit manager who sits in between hospitals and insurance companies and the pharmacies. Uh, of course, U.S. healthcare is much more complicated for various reasons. We'll go into that later on. So that's just a primer on the the language and the glossary. <clears throat> Coming to your question, Michael, uh, so the two-part question, why, why is healthcare maybe slower to innovate than other industries? And are there specific areas that, that are seeing a bit more innovation and a bit more challenges? Mm -hmm. Healthcare is special. Right? Healthcare deals with, of course, patient data. 
there are, there are different types of patient data. There's personal data or personally identifiable information, PII information, which includes your first name, last name, phone numbers, so on and so forth. Very similar to other industries. Then you have data which is related to your medical records, right? So each person or each patient or each consumer would have a personal medical record. And that record really belongs to that person. How that record is created and how that record is structured and stored is a different question altogether that needs to be addressed. Then you've got your, your medical history where you go to a, a, a provider, you go to a hospital, you go to an insurance company, you have a series of procedures, a series of visits, and that history builds up. And that history then needs to be shared with multiple organizations in order to ensure that you have the best possible care. Right? So you have multiple levels of data. Some of this data is very private to you, which shouldn't be shared, which should be owned by you. And some of this data is basically uh, be, uh, available to all other players as well. <clears throat> so in the healthcare space, because of these privacy concerns and these multiple layers of security concerns, organizations have been slow to innovate. Uh, if traditionally, healthcare data has been owned by the hospitals, by the providers, and the easiest way to secure this data is to ensure that this data is, is not shared and it's really difficult to obtain by other parties. Right? So, so these organizations keep this data, they store the data, maybe it's in proprietary data formats, and if you need to move from one network to another network, that includes a lot of process, uh, maybe even faxing information across. Right? Mm -hmm. So healthcare has been slow in that aspect. And patients also go to provider networks or pay payer networks, depending on the quality of the physicians, the, the lab technology, the service, etc., versus the digital aspects. If you look at something like banking and finance and retail and so on and so forth, consumer digital experience has come to the forefront. Right? So you make decisions based on how good your digital experience is. But in healthcare, it has not come to the forefront yet. People still make uh, decisions based on who's the best orthopedic surgeon and, and where can I get that service from, regardless of whether that's the best digital experience. So that's, that's one of the main reasons why healthcare has been slower uh, to innovate. That's interesting. So kind of part of the slowness is because of privacy and because of the unique aspects of uh, patient data and who owns it. But the other part is kind of like, we're a captive audience and uh, we'll just go to whoever the best doctor is as opposed to, you know, whoever provides the best digital experience. I think that might be changing over time, um, hopefully, um, you know, as some, some, some providers or payers within the, within the healthcare industry try to differentiate themselves, not just because they're the best surgeon or deliverer of services, but because they have a great digital experience. Do you think, think that might happen, hopefully? Absolutely. <clears throat> I think the world is changing, right? And, and uh, the pandemic also sort of forced people into this aspect. As, as with many industries, as with education and, and many other industries, uh, healthcare was one of the industries which said, we can only perform the best if you come in in person. Right? And if you have a physical experience, we can see you, we can touch you, we can see what's wrong and then provide the best experience. Uh, telemedicine has always been around. Uh, there, have, there are many organizations that have been successful with telemedicine, but mm -hmm. to a certain extent, it was not for the mass audience. Right? Uh, the pandemic sort of forced digital experience down everyone's throats in a, in a, in a good way and a, and a bad way. Right? So, so basically, if you need the best possible care, then you had to resort to telemedicine. The organizations that had telemedicine were well suited for this. The organizations that didn't have had to scramble to set up this technology. But at the end of the day, it worked. The world worked and telemedicine really kicked off and digital experiences uh, became a mainstay for healthcare. Uh, today, you have technologies like not only telemedicine, but, but remote patient care. You have digital front doors, so on and so forth, where Patients can interact with providers and payers. They can pick who the right providers they want. They can do on-demand consultation, so on and so forth. 
So this whole digital experience concept that was introduced during the pandemic or made popular during the pandemic is now really taking off. And like you rightly said, Michael, now digital experience is starting to become a differentiator. And, and going forward, we're going to see more of this where people pick convenience over the right position, et cetera, because you can always, you have the power of choice. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I, I think the purpose of your ebook is to talk about what are the customer identity strategies to improve those digital experiences. And, you know, so let's talk about customer identity and access management for a second. Um, there's different types of, of users or customers uh, in, in healthcare. There's the, the consumers or the patients, uh, but there's also other businesses like, you know, a primary care physician sharing information with a lab or referring a patient to a specialist, right? So there's kind of B2C Siam, business to consumer, and there's business to business Siam. Can you kind of talk about the differences between those two? Absolutely. So in the Siam space, uh, and, and basically consumer identity access management or customer identity access management. Uh, as you likely, rightly said, Michael, in the healthcare space, you have the consumers, right? You have the patients. If you are part of a hospital network, if you are part of the insurance network, you call yourselves members in the US. Uh, and, and then you, you basically have pharmacy organizations, you have consumers of pharmaceutical products, so on and so forth, right? So there are different types of consumers. Uh, and these are all an organization dealing with an individual. So it's a business to consumer relationship or B2C for short. Uh, and, and then, of course, when you take these organizations themselves, you take the, the hospitals, you have the physicians, you have the lab, lab technicians, you have the administrative staff, uh, and then you have multiple levels of these uh, hospital networks, so on and so forth. So these then become the employers or employee-employer relationship within those organizations. So that's traditionally known as a B to E, a business to employee uh, relationship, or in some circles, it's called as a workforce identity access management. Right? So, and, and then of course, you have a larger, much more intricate, complex play where you have a hospital network and that network owns maybe 100 to 200 hospitals. And each of those hospitals then have their own sets of users, their own sets of patients, lab technicians, so on and so forth. And that's a business to business relationship. In, in healthcare, it goes one step further because now a hospital needs to work with 10,000 other insurance companies. It needs to work with 20,000 other pharmaceutical companies. And these are all different enterprises. So these are all different levels of business to business communications. So that's a B2B uh, Siam uh, relationship. So, so you have the B2C, you have the B2B, you have the B2E, and then you can also still keep going down the uh, process as well. So you can have an organization dealing with consumers, so that's a B2B to B2C, so on and so forth. So in the book, we're trying to keep it very high level. Uh, we can go into details in each of those areas, and I think we do have separate articles to address some of those. Uh, but, but there are multiple challenges, multiple complexities in dealing with all these situations. And, and that's where a good Siam solution comes in. Awesome. All right. So, you know, when we talk about patient 360, uh, in the ebook, you mentioned that it could be Siam that delivers that. It could be integration that delivers that, or it could be both. Can you talk a little bit about the different use cases that you've been involved with? Absolutely. So if you look at the concept of a customer 360 view, right? So many industries have this. If you take retail, retail needs to see a, a customer 360 across the board so that they can track who is buying what. If you take a hospitality industry, uh, and, and we recently worked with the Hard Rock Hotel Group, the Hilton Hotel Group, etc. So a patron who walks into the hotel be, should be able to be, uh, be tracked across the hotel chain, whichever branch they go to, whichever restaurant they go to, whichever cafe they go to, so on and so forth, right? So it's a patron 360 view. 
And that's a basis of being able to launch other digital products as well. Like, for example, if you need to launch a loyalty product, you first need to be able to track who the customer is. In healthcare, this story is a bit different, right? When you say patient 360, there are two or three lenses that kick in. One is this concept of a longitudinal health record, which means if I'm a patient and if I visit one hospital, I get a set of patient records. But then if I visit 10 other hospitals and 20 other pharmacies, etc., that record builds up. So as a patient, how can I track all of the history of my healthcare visits? How can I track all of my personally identifiable information, so on and so forth? Putting all of this together is what is called the longitudinal health record, an LHR in healthcare. And, and that's one version of the patient 360. So when people talk about patient 360, they say, here's the patient. How do you gather all this information, either for personal use of that patient or to be able to share with the right consultants? Right? And that primarily involves a lot of integration because you need to tap into different data sources, pull that data, cleanse that data, make it interoperable, and then putting it, putting it into a format that can be stored and used. You then have a separate lens, which is an identity lens. Now, when a patient comes in, how do you identify that this patient, Michael, for example, is the same Michael who goes to this hospital versus this hospital versus this other pharmaceutical organization? So how do you track that person? Do you use a unique ID? Do you use a unique patient ID? Do you use a combination of first names and last names? So on and so forth. So how do you track that person? And then when that person goes from network to network or product to product, can you give a unified login experience? Can you give secured authentication experiences like multi-factor authentication and multi-step authentication? Can you let them federate to their own internal hospital systems? So all of those are a secondary identity lens that applies to patient 360, which is why I feel healthcare is special when it comes to this customer 360 concept. There's a lot of integration involved, but at the same time, there's a lot of CIM or identity aspects involved as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I personally experienced an improvement in, in this area as far as, you know, instead of going to a doctor and filling out every form of, you know, my medical history and what medications I'm on and all that stuff, um, you know, they come to me and say, like, kind of here's what we think your here's what we think your history is and what medications you're on. Is there anything you want to change about that? And that's like really awesome because I don't as a patient, I don't have to kind of tell everybody everything that I've already told other people. Right. So starting to see some of that kind of personalization come up. Absolutely. So AI, uh, we've seen AI, you know, hit our lives in many different ways. Is are there any signs that um, AI is being put to to use in healthcare? I was waiting for that AI question. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I mean AI in in everything, right? And AI in anything. Uh, healthcare, absolutely. There there are multiple use cases that we are seeing today already. Uh, in the past, it was a little bit of AI and a little bit of machine learning and working with data and so on and so forth. Now it's it's a bit more predictive analysis, so on and so forth as well. Uh, there are multiple industries that are working in different areas. Um, if you look at the likes of Microsoft, so on and so forth, uh, they they've been working in uh, how do you how do you basically look at X-ray images and imagery data and so on and so on and so forth and try to figure out specific use case out of that by looking at an image itself. So traditionally, you have a lab technician or physician or doctor looking at these images and making a, a call. But now you have these systems that can go through millions of images, compare against each other, figure out what best practices and what patterns are there, and then look at a new image and see what, what's going on with that and, and make a decision based on that. And that can be an augmentative technology to doctors and physicians not to replace anyone, but to basically help them and provide better service. Uh, you, you also have a lot of AI-based technologies being applied into different areas of healthcare. So even, in, even if you take patient identification in the US, right? So in the US today, 
because of privacy concerns, there, there, is, there is a lack of federal level patient identification or user identification. There are, of course, state level identification systems. There are hospital network level identification systems. So all of these exist, but there isn't a central federal level system similar to some other countries. So some, some countries have really good central identity systems for patients uh, and seamless way of identifying a patient across the board. And some countries don't have it, uh, may, mainly due to privacy reasons. So AI kicks in here as well, where you can figure out that this person, even though they have the uh, same first name, but different last name and so on and so forth, it is the same person across the board, right? So there is a lot of AI initiatives used in being able to track who the uh, patient is. And, and there are multiple other uses of uh, AI in, in healthcare as well, similar to any, any other industry. There are some, uh, so I, in the paper, I talk about some specific examples where uh, you, you have all these wearables and devices today, right? And even with the iPhone, there was a, there was a project to see if, if the phone falls down, does that mean the person has fallen down with the phone as well? And there are these companies and startups who have wearable devices to track uh, elderly care or to assist with elderly care and to detect falls and detect uh, strokes and so on and so forth and alert medical responders and first range responders, etc. So there's a lot of real world use case uh, when it comes to healthcare and AI. Uh, even in the SIAM space, uh, like I mentioned, patient identification is one aspect, but there are many aspects coming into the SIAM space uh, as, as well in the, in the healthcare side. And, and we talk about some of these in the uh, paper too. Right. So on the patient identification topic, is is this a different challenge depending on where you are in the world? You, you talked about the U.S. being a, maybe a little different than other places. Yes. Ag again, there are different driving factors behind it. Uh, in, in the U.S., as I mentioned, privacy is, is one of the driving factors. Uh, and, and this is not unique to healthcare. This is, this is also prevalent in other industries in the U.S. as well and some other countries too. There have been some initiatives, especially in the U.S. Uh, there's the Karin Alliance, who is working on a patient-centric uh, identity. Uh, and and that's, that's still taking time. That might come up in the future or it might not come up in the future. Uh, for the time being, there is an intricate way of using the first names, last names, date of birth, so on and so forth to track a patient. And as I previously mentioned, if you're within a specific hospital network or if you're using a specific electronic medical record system or health record system, there are ways of, of having a patient ID associated with you. The question is, is there a patient ID that can be ported from one organization to the other? Uh, countries like India have a unique national health ID, uh, which is tied to the India's national health ID system, the Aadhaar ID system. Uh, so there are countries that are way more advanced when it comes to tracking a patient or, or uniquely being able to identify a patient. And, and there are many European countries and, and many uh, countries in the Middle East and region, et cetera, who have a similar model as well. But you, I, I don't think you can have a global policy saying there should be a uniquely identifiable patient ID because it comes down to regional intricacies, right? Each region have different privacy laws. Each region have different ways of tracking patients. Uh, in most cases, if there is a national ID, then a a healthcare ID can also be tied into that. But if there's no national ID system in the first place, then reinventing the wheel and trying to come up with a unique healthcare ID is not an easy uh, problem to solve. Right? So again, very, very regional, very localized aspects here. Okay, that makes sense. So I love how when you defined customers, you talked about the patients, you talked about other other businesses or parts of the network, and you actually talked about the employees or the workforce. Um, you know, so doctors, nurses, lab techs, all these uh, people that are in the workforce, you know, they should, they should be able to like easily get access to the applications that they need to do their job and have that be a secure experience. So, you know, just talk a little bit about the B2E aspect of Siam and how that's really important within healthcare. Yeah. So when it comes to B2C, of course, portability is important, right? So you're being able to move from one organization to the other, et cetera. When it comes to B2E, 
basically access control and workforce identity? Uh, how do you ensure that certain users access certain parts of your data and the organization, but they cannot access the other parts of the data and organization? These are very important aspects, uh, especially if you're consuming from 10 to 20 different systems, which is often the case in, in hospital networks. You need to have really good single sign-on experience across these applications. You need to have multi-factor authentication that kicks in based on your, your ability to access systems, the level of uh, authentications, the level of access, et cetera, uh, so on and so forth. In, in certain situations, you have physical identities as well. You have, you have smart cards, you have a token-based identity that, that comes in. So these are all important aspects. In the healthcare space, uh, the core system is usually an electronic medical risk, uh, record system and an electronic health record system, similar to how banking and finance have co-banking systems, right? Uh, so in, in these spaces, these EMRs, EHRs provide a lot of capability. They provide the ability to create and store patient data. Uh, they provide uh, outpatient data, ambulatory data. Uh, they sometimes provide interoperability data and portals and applications and mobile applications, so on and so forth. So these are vast systems in some cases. In some cases, these are very, very simplified uh, point solutions. So one important aspect, one, one aspect that healthcare is struggling with is when a new employee joins, how do you onboard that employee onto this EMR as well as all the other systems that the, the hospital has? And when an employee leaves, how do you offload them or offboard them from these systems? So that's a traditional workforce CIM concern as well. But again, now you're dealing with multiple systems. Uh, the other big concern is if the EMR already has some kind of an identity authentication mechanism, how do you federate into that? So even right. if you have a SIAM solution, how do you federate into the EMR's authentication system as well as your CRM's authentication system and so on and so forth instead of expecting these users to recreate credentials in each and every system? Right? So these are unique challenges that has to be addressed for the workforce of the organization. So that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, you talk to a lot of CIOs. We've seen some progress with these, you know, digital projects. You know, what, would, what does the CIO need to kind of hear to get on board with, um, with projects to improve the digital experience? Kind of what's, what's the CIO ultimately looking for here? So, it, again, it differs from country to country. And then that's a very good question, by, by the way. At the end of the day, uh, as similar to any organization, healthcare organizations have specific goals. Uh, whether that goal is a, is a profit-making goal or whether it's a service-oriented goal uh, or, or whether it's multiple, uh, it's a combination of multiple aspects. In the U.S., uh, healthcare organizations have to aim for what is called a triple aim of healthcare, which is a focus on patient experience, uh, a focus on pro population health, and a focus on health, reducing healthcare costs overall. In, in some places like the UK, the NHS funded healthcare system, uh, healthcare is generally free for, for patients, right? So in that case, how do you provide a better service? How do you provide a much more timely service, a much more quality service, so on and so forth. So different regions have specific goals. When it comes to CIOs, so reducing the cost of healthcare is critical and, and data basically helps in that. Because if you have to recreate everything and, and go look for data and, and then do the tests that have already been done just because you don't have access to that data, that's just increasing costs. So having good data, having interoperable data, having the ability to share this information real time is, is critical in reducing that, that uh, healthcare costs aim. And that's, that's one of the triple aims of, of healthcare. Right? When it comes to improving patient experience, there's a lot of aspects there. Uh, but a return of investment is a key factor for CIOs, right? Like how do you bring in the right technologies? How do you bring in the right interoperability technologies? And how do you see a return of investment? And how do you measure that? Because as I mentioned, in, in the healthcare space, you have these EMRs, EHRs. I have a specific section addressing how far do you go with these EMRs, EHRs? Like you can go all the way with some of these EMRs and you can say, 
I'm going to do identity. I'm going to do interoperability. I'm going to do uh, mobile application in a marketplace. But then that's, that's one system. And how do you bring in all kinds of a multi-vendor ecosystem? Right? So to do that, you need a layer that sits above, a CIM layer that sits above, an interoperability that sit, layers that sits above that can talk to all these systems independently. So CIOs need to be able to understand that bigger picture vision. Uh, they, they need to understand how to deliver digital products faster. But at the same time, they need to be able to figure out how to measure their return of investment. How do you measure digital experience? How do you measure customer effectiveness and patient experience? Uh, and, and, and how do you basically bring that home? Right? So these are all uh, concerns of the CIOs. There are some good articles that we link to in the book. There is a McKenzie article that talks about some of the top trends in, in this space and how various CIOs are coping with that and, and addressing those challenges. Uh, and, and this is a vast area. Uh, this is very similar to other industries as well. But as we said repeatedly on this session, healthcare is special, right? And, and there are different aspects that come into the healthcare space. That's great. So I'm going to give you, uh, you, you introduced a, a great, interesting, compelling um, concept of a digital patient double. And so for the last question, I just want to kind of ask you, you know, you talked about projects could be involving SIAM or integration or both, like what would really be required to achieve and support the digital patient double? Thanks. And, and thanks. That's a great question and a very broad question as well. Right? So defining the digital patient double. Right? So if you take any industry, uh, you, you have the physical representation of a person. Right? So there's, there's a person who walks in to see a physician or a doctor. So that's the physical representation of the person. And then when, when you log into these systems and you access these systems and you provide access to <clears throat> uh, different systems, etc., you have a digital version of, of yourself, and that's the digital double, right? And being able to uh, track that digital double, having a, a unique ID for that, that, uh, that representation, being able to say that this person has access to these different systems, and also very importantly, being able to say that this person has given consent to access this data and share this data, et cetera, the whole consent management thing is big in healthcare. And and this this concept is the is the digital double concept, right? To to create a digital, so wh why do you need a digital double? <clears throat> so digital double is is a way of enhancing patient experience, digital patient experience, right? Regardless of whether you come through a mobile application, regardless of whether you come through Apple Health as your main application, right? You can use Apple Health to access all of your healthcare systems in in multiple countries. Uh, regard of whether you're coming through a kiosk or whether you are using a web application. Uh, in some cases, you have to use the, the electronic medical record systems portal itself. Uh, I, I'm based in the US. I'm traveling to Sri Lanka. Uh, today, I tried to access the portal and I cannot do that because I'm outside the US. Right? Uh, and I need to do it through a VPN. Now, that's good in terms of security. It's not so good in terms of experience because traveling outside the country is a, is a normal thing. Right? And I still need to access my health records. So, so this concept of being able to look at people as a digital double and then starting to think in terms of how do I provide a better experience for this digital double? And by doing so, how do I give uh, the best experience for the physical person themselves is, is, is very critical. So more... Most organizations, if not all organizations from any part of healthcare, needs to start thinking in terms of the digital double and, and look at like how do you really provide the best experience? How do you provide a seamless experience, a frictionless experience uh, across, across the board? Uh, that's great. So thank you very much uh, for uh, this chat. Um, I, I think it was very insightful. And um, also thank you very much for your ebook. Um, if, if anybody enjoyed this conversation, I encourage you to, uh, to read the uh, publication uh, to get more information. So thanks a lot, Mafon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everyone. <laughs>